Welcome to episode 18 of my guide to video game history. The year is 1987 and Nintendo is the undisputed king of consoles, with almost a complete dominance of the console market in America, with one in three homes owning a NES console, and in Japan the Nintendo Famicom dominance was even more. Nintendo ruled their empire with an iron fist beating down and controlling every aspect of publishers who wished to write games for their console. It was only in Europe and other regions where, due to mismanagement on Nintendo's part, was their influence weaker, and other systems allowed to flourish away from Nintendo's clutches. Publishers would have a love-hate relationship with Nintendo. They hated Nintendo's seeming favoritism with certain publishers, and for others only allowing them to release only three games a year, a measure on Nintendo's part to ensure quality of the games. This meant that the risks were catastrophic for publishers, where a failed game literally would cost thousands and potentially bring down the company, because you couldn't recoup the costs that year. But of course, there was the Nintendo love from publishers, as if you wrote a hit, then you stood to make some serious profit. But then, in 1987, the first attack would happen to Nintendo, with the PC Engine in Japan. Suddenly, there was a console with better graphics and sound that was starting to show the Famicom's console's age, eating into their Japanese domestic market. Nintendo knew that to keep their dominance over the video game market, they would have to come out with new hardware. And when, in October 1988, Sega released their new console, the Mega Drive, and started stealing America's market away, they knew they had to do things quickly. The problem is, when you have such dominance and your profits are tied up almost exclusively with your existing hardware, releasing a new console is always risky, and if you get it wrong, you could turn around your success of the company. But the unenviable task to create the new console was again placed in the capable hands of Masayuki Umera, who had been the genius engineer behind the original Famicom or NES console. Originally, Nintendo's president Hiroshi Yamuchi had insisted that the new console be backwards compatible. But when it was clear how far hardware had come, and that to do backward compatibility would cost another £40 to the price of the console, this was reluctantly dropped after many attempts to achieve it. But the console Masayuki and his team had designed was again a wonder of engineering and unparalleled graphics, being the very pinnacle of 2D gaming with up to 32,000 colours available and a whole stack of different layers that allowed a, a whole host of graphical wizardry. Called modes, these layers allowed amazing flexibility with game sprites allowing developers to easily resize sprites and rotate and flip them very quickly. The most famous mode of all of these, of course, was Mode 7, which allowed turning a sprite on a horizontal plane and rotating it, resulting in a wonderful pseudo-3D effect that would be used again and again to brilliant effect in many SNES games. But it wasn't just under the hood that was improved. Also, the look of the console had been redesigned for the 90s, with a streamlined, sleeker device with alluring curves and more sophisticated grey and cream colour scheme that looked simply gorgeous for the time. The controller as well had been totally revamped from the original Famicom or NES controller, with it now having an ergonomic shape to be much more comfortable in the gamer's hands. With a cross-shaped four-button layout with additional or two buttons on the controller's shoulders to allow a, a dizzying array of game buttons to be used and a layout structure still used by all the main consoles even today. One advantage of the Nintendo's reluctance to release a new console meant that the game developers would have oodles of time to spend with the console and learn its intricacies of the hardware, and so have the time to be able to hone the initial games to absolute perfection. And when you have the world's greatest game developer, Shigeru Miyamoto, and 30 of Japan's cream talent working for him, you just know that they're going to produce something special. Consequently, the games ready for launch in Japan would be the greatest lineup ever in any console launch release, with two games not only good, 
but still to this day considered some of the best games of all time. The first game ready for launch was Super Mario World, which would have Takashi Tezuka, who had been working with Shigeru already as co-director on many of the previous Mario games, and would be given for this the main directorship of this game, with Shigeru Miyamoto taking more of a producer role, overseeing multiple projects. The game was the fourth in the Mario series, and it would take three years and 16 people to produce the game. A phenomenal amount of time to develop a game back then, but that loving time spent on it showed with every pixel, and with it taking what was great in the first three NES titles, but revamped it with pretty SNES visuals, and yet improving on the gameplay aspects of all the previous games, with a multi-route map and almost 100 levels of pure gaming nirvana, with each level sporting abstract imagery by Shigefumi Hino that perfectly complemented the game, giving it a beautiful, unique look, without distracting too much from what was going on in the foreground. The game also cried out many more innovations and ideas that most games could only dream of, with each level offering something fresh and surprising, whether it graphical wizardry to rotate platforms, or supersizing bosses, or giving Mario such power-ups as the cape, which allowed those who could master it to reach additional areas not possible to reach without it. They also introduced a new game character to help you on your quest, called Yoshi, a dragon that would give Mario a helpful ride through some of the levels, and would prove so popular with gamers he would later return in his own games. Finally, Koji Kondo, who had produced all the previous Mario and Zelda music, was back again to recreate the audio magic for the new game, rounding off the package nicely. Mean Machines gave this game a whopping 98% back in the day, and 20 million game cartridges were sold for the game, although this does include the game bundle. Nevertheless, this goes down as one of the greatest selling games, certainly on the Super Nintendo. The other launch game was a futuristic Formula One racer, F-Zero, and was designed by Isin Tsumizu, with Shigeru Miyamoto, the game taking the role of producer. The game was a marvel to behold, with it making full use of the SNES Mode 7 function giving the game a wonderful pseudo 3 effect that was revolutionary for the time. I remember initially seeing the game around a friend's house and initially perhaps not too keen on the hovering Formula 1 craft thinking real cars would have been better. Those thoughts quickly evaporated however when I finally got to play the game and raced my way around the 15 tracks using the SNES control pad which was perfectly matched for the game. Also, by each of the cars having a racing character associated with them, such as a heroic Captain Falcon or Samurai Goro, meant you weren't just beating a faceless driver, but characters you would love and loathe in equal measure. The game also introduced a wonderful recharge pit stop, which gave the race a wonderful risk and reward mechanism, as you could use the sides of the tracks and other races to aid you by doing a controlled collision, but not too much as your craft would become toast. Also, on each subsequent lap, you were given a boost power-up to go nitro-fast, which used at the right time to turn a race around, making you the winner. Meme Machines gave this classic 90% on release, noting that they loved the game, but they found the later tracks too hard. Consequently, with such a strong launch title lineup, when it was finally announced for Nintendo's new machine called the Super Family Computer or Super Famicom, and screenshots for these new games trickled out in magazines, the Japanese people's desire for the new Nintendo console would reach fever pitch, with November the 21st, 1990 being set as launch day. The launch date only being given a few weeks before by Nintendo, and so caused a flurry of panic pre-orders, as parents and gamers frantically tried to make sure that they would have the machine for Christmas. Such was the demand that some stores even insisted that the full price of the console would be paid up front as a deposit to get the console. Other shops instead fell back on a lottery system for pre-orders, 
and the Hankyo department store even stopped taking pre-orders only days after initially allowing them as demand was simply too great. So on the eve of launch, Nintendo would only have 300,000 consoles ready, far short of the 1.5 million pre-orders that had been made for the machine. Even so, Nintendo would have to do the distribution under a veil of secrecy, as rumours of the Japanese mafia Yakuza Ring were planning to hijack the delivering lorries and sell consoles on the black market. To combat this, Nintendo did Operation Midnight, where Nintendo sent out lorries a day early at midnight with 110 ton lorries each carrying 3,000 units around the country. Even so, with such a shortfall of over a million consoles, there would be many customers, of course, disappointed. One store owner, after only receiving six units, was so afraid and embarrassed, he actually didn't open up his store, instead putting up a sign saying that he and his family had gone away on holiday. Also, the console launch date had been released on a Wednesday, and so it caused major disruptions as gamers went off ill to pick up the console. This weekday release caused so much disruption in fact that the Japanese government requested that all future console releases would be done on the weekend. The machine would go on to sell 2 million consoles in Japan in the first 6 months alone and by the end of 1991 they had sold 4 million consoles in the Japan region. The next region Nintendo would tackle would be the US and their release date was on the 23rd of August 1991. The console was rebranded to the Super Nintendo Entertainment System otherwise known as the Super NES or SNES. Bizarrely, they redesigned the console for this new region, with the uglier, boxier and chunkier looking console to its sleeker Japan cousin. Selling for $199, Nintendo would have a tougher time in this region, as by the end of 1991, the Sega Genesis had had such a head start on the Nintendo's machine, with stacks of games that were tailored for the US market. But Nintendo would also have another launch game ready for its already strong lineup with the brilliant Pilot Wings. This again used the clever Mode 7 effect, but this time you had to fly a variety of flying machines to earn licenses and so unlock ever more powerful flying machines. The game was again great with Tadashi Tsujiyama as director and again Shigeru Miyamoto as producer. The game was not only wonderful for its lovely graphics and its open-ended slow-paced gaming, it was truly unique for the time. It meant you really could let loose and have fun with the game, never feeling too constrained and a wonderful fresh gaming experience could be enjoyed that hadn't really been around before. Mean Machines gave this game 90%. Despite the great launch lineup, Nintendo failed to take market leader in the US with only 700,000 units sold to Sega's million in their first year. However, as time would progress and the SNES game catalogue would swell with many great games and of course the initial exclusive port of the brilliant Street Fighter 2 game meant that by the end of 1992, Nintendo actually began to outsell Sega. Of course, whilst all this was going on, in Europe and the rest of the world we had to patiently wait for our own release date. Eventually, April the 11th, 1992 was given. But such was the delay that at this time a thriving import business had begun, with many buying the consoles overseas and using converters to work on our TVs. On its release date, the console would sell in the UK for $149.99 and would come bundled with a brilliant Super Mario World game. Also, thankfully, the SNES console would be designed on the original Japanese look as opposed to the chunkier US one. It would also come with even more launch titles to add to the previous great games being released in the other regions. There was Super Soccer by Human Entertainment, which again made use of the Mode 7 
graphics to give it a 3D looking game of football. It was gorgeous to look at, unfortunately nothing special to play, with Meme Machines giving it only 73%, saying that it simply didn't play a good game of football. But then you had the awesome Super Tennis by Nintendo, which offered a great fluid game of tennis, accompanied by a wide range of different players to choose from. Meme Machines gave this classic game 93%. Finally, you had Super R-Type, which was a port by Irem of their R-Type 2 game, but with extra stages thrown in. The game had its charms and would be unfortunately crippled by not only its platinum hard gameplay, but chronic slowdowns in places. Despite this, it was well received at the time, with Meme Machines noting the game's slowness, but still giving it 90%. For myself, I remember reading in my Games X magazine all about the new SNES console and drooling over the graphics that were strewn across the magazine. I remember working out that if I saved all my dinner money and pocket money, I could have one by the end of the year. And if I asked for money for my Christmas and birthday, I could possibly have it by Christmas. A plan which I sadly failed on my second day as I got too hungry. Consequently, I had to content myself with going round my friend's house, who had one of these marvellous machines, sat watching him play the games. Thankfully, my friend was quite a generous chap, and so we would share our time on the machine awkwardly, and so I got a good experience with this new console. The Stairs was one of the most successful consoles ever developed, and consequently would have many brilliant games released in its long lifespan. In the following part of the episode, I wanted to go through some of these great titles that were released for the machine. One of the earliest released of the console was Act Razor, released in December 1990. This was done by publisher Enix, who had made a name for itself with its Dragon Quest series on the NES, and newly created developer Quintet, who would go on to do the fantastic Soul Blazer trilogy games. In the game, you play a god who must help his people by destroying the demons who have terrorised the lands, and turn the land back into a place of happiness and prosperity again. This is done in two parts. Firstly, you must take charge of a hero and go on a quest to defeat the demons of the lands. And then the second part, once you've successfully done that, is help your people rebuild their city and destroy the demon nests that lurk nearby. This concept of aiding your city on the quest is a great idea that is surprising that we've not seen more of, as you aren't just going through a level but you're doing it to save your people from disaster. A second follow-up game was released in 1993 which sadly took away the city building part of the game and so unfortunately turned it into a generic and tough run and hack platform. Then, in Halloween of 1991 in Japan, Super Castlevania IV was released. This was an update to the Castlevania games on the NES, but with much technical wizardry and game ideas throughout. Give this game a go and stick with it, as it does take a while to get going, with Meme Machines notably giving it 93%. The SNES would also have a Castlevania Dracula X, or Vampire Kiss as we know it in Japan, which was based on the Castlevania Rondo of Blood game on the PC Engine. And, although many citing it as an inferior port to the PC Engine, it is still quite an enjoyable game. Also, the SNES would see the continuation of the Final Fantasy series. Now, I'm not going to go into the confusing numbering structure of how 4 is number 2 in the US, etc. But suffice to say, these are really quite good games. All of these were quite an enjoyable continuation of the series, if you like the Final Fantasy games, taking things further from the humble NES origins. But then, they would release Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past in November 1991, with Takashi Tezuka and Shigeru Miyamoto, who would update another of Shigeru's games for the new console. This was the third Zelda game being released, and got everything right, using up the new console's power and selling 4.61 million cartridges, making it the fifth best-selling game on the SNES console. And you can see why. With its a massive, expansive world for you to explore, still for many being one of their favourite games ever 
released. It had everything from the engaging story by Yoshiaki Kazumi and, of course, a revamped Zelda music by Koji Kondo again. Mean Machines rightly gave this game 95%. The game, Contra, or Griser as we knew it in Europe, was a rock-hard run-and-gun game that had been a huge hit in the arcades back in the day. So, when Konami announced it would be doing Contra 3, Alien War, there was much excitement. Bizarrely, in Europe, we got the game released as Super Pro Protector, Alien Rebels, that bizarrely replaced all the bad guys as robots. This game wasn't a game for the faint-hearted, with a difficulty level designed to make a grown man weep, but for those who had the stones for it, the game was a masterful game that really showed off the console's power, and a skill that Konami possessed with writing games for the SNES console. Meme Machines gave this game 95%, commenting on the game's hardness, but wowing at the graphics and the effects in the game. The Snares may have been chipping away at the Sega's extensive lead, but it was one game that helped them smash past Sega, and that was the exclusive port of the Street Fighter II World Warrior game, released in June 1992. It's difficult for people not there at the time to understand how important this game was, and so having an excellent port of the arcade classic on only the Snares meant that every gamer would do anything they could to get the game. And what a port it was with a controller allowing you to have all the buttons used in the arcade and with only slight minor changes to the graphics and not the gameplay. Meme Machines rightly gave this 98% back in the day and I couldn't agree more. Tadashi Sujiyama may have shown the power of Mode 7 with his game Pilot Wings but it was in August 1992 when he and fellow Hideki Kono who had done many of the sublime levels in the Super Mario World game, would team up together with Shigeru Miyamoto again as producer to helm the release of Super Mario Kart. In the game, you take control of Mario characters and race round its tracks. The game was immensely fun, offering a two-player split screen and crazy power-ups to hinder your opponents or help you gain some ground. The game was a huge success, selling 8 million cartridges for the game, being the third best-selling game for the console. Lean Machines gave the game 92%, stating they loved it but felt more work needed to be done on the single-player experience. In late 1992, Tiny Toon Adventure, Buster Busts Loose, would be released in Japan by Konami and would offer a vibrant and wacky platformer with six stages of mayhem based on the cartoon released of the same name. I remember first seeing the game not believing how it was just like watching a cartoon and then being pleasantly surprised to also find out how well the game played. Also in December 1992, LucasArts would finally release a decent Star Wars game with Super Star Wars which was a remake of the NES classic, but making full use of the new console's power. Then the following year, in December 1993, Super Empire Strikes Back was released, which continued the rock-hard gameplay of the first, but set it to the plot of the second film. Finally, Super Return of the Jedi was released in 1994, which rounded off the trilogy nicely. London-based developer Argonaut Games had be long been respected since it had been set up by teenager Jez Sam in 1982, with Argonaut releasing such classics as Star Glider and Birds of Prey, to name but a few. They also released a game called X in 1992, being one of the first games to be able to do 3D on the Game Boy. Nintendo was so impressed with Argonaut achieving that what they thought personally was impossible to do, they invited Argonaut Software to help them in doing 3D for their SNES machine. Key members of Argonaut went across to Nintendo and helped them design a coprocessor that would be in the game cartridge, originally called the Mario chip and later named as the Super FX chip, which allowed the first game Argonaut Software and Nintendo to create. 
called Starwing as we knew it in Europe or Star Fox everywhere else and released in February 1993. It was a dream collaboration with Argonaut using all their 3D technical knowledge to write the game engine and Nintendo director Katsuya Aguchi and Shigeru Miyamoto producing to offer the usual high standard of gameplay and imagination that Nintendo always provided. In the game you played Fox the Cloud who must lead his animal team to fight the dastardly Andros aliens who have threatened their home planet of Chimeria. The game was a massive success, selling 4 million cartridges and being the 8th most popular game sold on the console. Mean Machines gave it 96%, commenting on the amazing visuals and atmospheric sound and great compelling gameplay. In July 1993, Super Mario All-Stars was released on the SNES. It generously took the first three games released on the NES and the Japanese version of Super Mario Bros. 2, which they redubbed the Super Mario The Lost Levels. The game compilation was great, with each of the games graphically tweaked for the new console, but retaining all the gameplay and game mechanics of those originals. In August 1993, Final Fantasy Publishers Square would release their own take on the Zelda games with Secret of Mana, being the sequel of Final Fantasy Adventure released on the Game Boy. I simply adore this game with its luscious graphics and quality story. If you haven't played this and you love RPGs, then go out and play it now assure you you won't be disappointed. Takuru Fujiwara would bring his Mega Man games finally onto the SNES in December 1993 with Mega Man X, which was a fantastic update having you play another Mega Man character a hundred years later from the original games. The game made good use of the SNES hardware and offered gamers a challenging platformer that was a joy to play. Of course, stacks of sequels would be released including Mega Man 7 and two more Mega Man X games. Oh, and there was also Mega Man Soccer, but that's probably best left forgotten. Shadowrun, which was a tabletop RPG set in the futuristic cyberpunk world, would be turned into the excellent SNES game released in March 1994. Based on the Shadowrun novel Never Deal with a Dragon, it had you play Jake Armitage, who after being left dead by a Mafia hit squad, wakes up in a morgue with amnesia and and so must relearn his identity and why he is wanted dead, and so work out how to stop them. Truly, this is an underrated classic, and again, if you love RPGs, you really must play this game. UK developer Rare and the Stamper Brothers, Tim and Chris, had long been gaming gods ever since 1983, when they revolutionised the Spectrum gaming scene, releasing such hits as Lunar Jetman, Attic Attack, Saberwolf and Nightlaw with their company Ultimate Play the Game. Then it all went quiet on the Spectrum scene as the Stamper Brothers had created another company called Rare to do games for the new NES console. And on that machine they had continued to win over gamers' hearts with the awesome games such as Slalom, Snake Rattle and Roll, RC Pro AM and the Wizard and Warriors series. Oh and also the Battletoad games. On the SNES, however, they really would join the SNES party quite late. But when they joined, oh boy did they join. For in November 1994, it would wow all. For the game they created was Donkey Kong Country. And the game came about when Tim and Chris had been playing around with their 3D silicon graphic workstation to see if they could make 3D game models and then scan them in as flat sprites on the SNES. Initially, they tried to work on a boxing game, but they instead decided to do a platformer based on the classic Nintendo game character Donkey Kong. The game was stunning, with 3D looking visuals that you simply couldn't believe back in the day. But it also had, of course, the rare sense of humour and polished gameplay that Rare were known for. Finally, one should note the music by David Wise who was a rare veteran for the company, and would create the perfect accompanying music for the game, being addictive and catchy. Shigeru Miyamoto was admirably hands-off with the game, only giving subtle suggestions to the look and feel of the game character, but otherwise leaving the game in the hands of Rare. The game sold fantastically well, selling 8 million cartridges and being the second best-selling game release on the 
the snares and giving a snares a much needed life boost against the newer consoles being released at the time. Two sequels would follow, being Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Kong's Quest, released in November 1995, and Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie's Kong Double Trouble, released in December 1996. Both would reach critical acclaim, although by now most gamers had moved over to the PlayStation and other consoles and so missed out on these classic games. One overlooked classic on the SNES is the puzzle game Pieces, released in 1994. The game took the idea of building jigsaws against an opponent to win. To make things tougher, you can use power-ups that will hinder your opponent or aid you to complete your own jigsaw. To hear it described, it probably won't win you over, but give this game a go and I'm convinced you will also learn to love this game. In March 1994, Super Metroid would finally be released, with the original Metroid veterans Makoto Kano and Yoshio Sakamoto, who did the original games, and so taking all that was great about the original classics on the NES, but utilising the power of the SNES console to make everything simply gorgeous to both play and look at. With NMS magazine giving it 92% and stating that it was a perfectly designed game with only a few negligible flaws. In August 1994, HAL Laboratory, who were known for their Kirby games, and H Software, with a quite batty Shigesatu Itoi at the helm, released Earthbound, which was Mother 2 in Japan, and a sequel to the offbeat humorous RPG, whereby you and your friends tried to discover why a meteor crash landed up in the hills. I could talk about this game all day long, but I won't. Suffice to say that if you love RPGs and love zany humour, then you will love this peach of a game. In August 1995, Mario 5 would be released and be a little bit different from the previous Mario games. Called Super Mario World 2, Yoshi Island, it had you play Yoshi as a main character with Mario being a baby you must carry across the levels to safety. The original team of developers were all back again, and the game cartridge also having the 3DFX2 chip to do some of the code processing, you were left with a simply visually stunning game. Whether it's the beautiful hand-drawn pastel backgrounds or the near-perfect level design, this game would keep you in platforming heaven and it's only sad that it came so late in the SNES life cycle that it made less of an impact than it really should have. The game is one of my favourite platformers and I can't sing its praises enough. It's nice to think that one of SNES's last real hurrah games such a cracker such as this. In March 1995, the RPG Dream Team would come together to try and release the ultimate RPG game of all time, called Chrono Trigger, and bringing together such talents of Square and the Final Fantasy and Dragon Ball Z games. There was the talents of Hironobu Sakaguchi on hand as designer, Takashi Tokita, Yoshinori Kitasi, and Akihiko Matsui, all Final Fantasy veterans working on the game. The game was great, offering compelling story across four time zones as you tried to save your world. In March 1996, Nintendo and Square would join forces to create the brilliant RPG Super Mario RPG game called Legend of the Seven Stars. And you know, with Shigeru Miyamoto and Jihiro Fujioka of the Mother Games directing and a stack of cream of Nintendo and Square working for them, the game would be simply a joy to play, full of biting witticisms and a story that drew you into the wonderful Magic Kingdom world. Finally, in August 1996, two great swan song games were released for the console. There was Tetris Attack. This was a rebrand of the Japanese SNES game Panel de Pond. Consequently, it's nothing to do with Tetris, but what you have here is a brilliant puzzle game as you switch the coloured boxes to make three in a row and disappear. The puzzle section is particularly enjoyable with some real genius brain twisters later on in the game. The other game that was released this month was Harvest Moon, released by Natsumi and mixing running a farm with an RPG in a wonderfully compelling game where you tend to your farm and even fall in love in the game. 
Throughout the SNES long life, there would be a host of great peripherals released for the machine. There was, in 1992, Mario Paint, which included a mouse and allowed you to draw and paint images much in the same way as Microsoft Paint. There was even a composer tool, allowing you to make music with your images. But of course, with nowhere to save your creations apart from perhaps out onto a VHS, it really was all rather pointless. But then there was Super Scope, a heavy bazooka-shaped light gun that then, when compared to the NES Zapper, was a little too cumbersome and so would only have a handful of games compatible for it. Then there was the Super Game Boy, which allowed you to play Game Boy cartridges through the TV. Finally, in February 1995 in Japan, there was a broadcast satellite, or BS, Satellaview, which was a method where, for a subscription, you could download broadcast games on the Giga radio at certain times to your cartridge. It would sell between 14 and 18,000 yen to buy, but then you would need a Giga Tuner at 33,000 yen, and then on top of all that, pay 5,400 yen for a 6 month subscription. Despite the high price point, those willing to foot the bill, many did, would enjoy some classic exclusive games that would be broadcast to the system, including F-Zero 2 and extra Zelda games. You'd also have stacks of NES and SNES games available to download. Well, that brings us to the end of episode 18. I think it's testament to a game system that so many great games have been left behind in this video, as there simply were so many wonderful games to include. Therefore, I will do an addendum music medley video to at least show some of these fabulous games. Thanks for watching, and look out for episode 19, where the world of PC gaming comes of age, and the world gets doomed. So, until next time, see you later.